adversaries is supposed to be an investigative work. Um, I kind of started with using Silver Blue as my workstation, uh, connected to my home uh, free APA deployment. And basically I'm using all the features of free APA from the Silver Blue to figure out uh, well, how does it help or does it not help to run all this. And this kind of investigation led to a few open points and I will go with them. But yesterday I just tried to have a fresh look at this. So let's say just take the uh, uh, a new installation. And obviously the default Fedora Silver Blue image, it doesn't include anything that you would actually need to have on the um, system to enroll in, into a domain. So none of the uh, free API client packages and all the dependencies, they are missing. Same with the uh, uh, deployment uh, with ActiveDisk, for example. You need to have at least uh, SSAD there or you need to have some Baldwin bind and modules and, and whatnot. And they are missing on the Ubuntu disk. So the, the whole idea is that you build custom image, obviously. But um, the way how it's structured is that, yes, you can build the image. Yes, you can rebase um, RPM or S3 to the installation to the new image. And that's flawless and that, that works and so on. But in reality, um, it would be first installation done with the uh, official images unless you build your own installer with it. And most people don't do it. So like yesterday we had the um, Ublu uh, talk and in, in, in that one, and if you look into Ublu um, website and try to download something, they are telling you that the, you install uh, Fedora Silver Blue images and then rebase to, to the ones so, okay, um, I did that. I installed Silver Blue and rebased it to my custom image that I'm using on my laptop. So this is an experiment with the VM, but okay. And, and obviously we want to have some sort of a fleet that is registered automatically and enrolled or unenrolled when machines go away. But first we need to do some manual stuff. So. On the first attempt, you get um, a, a typical installation, uh, and that fails horribly. And that's that's a failure. Uh, no such file or directory. Uh, the directory itself, Warleaf IPA client history store, is actually part of uh, RPM package, so it should have been being there, but it's not. And the reason is. Um, because the cool war has uh, a pretty uh, special handling in, in the um, RPM or S3 uh, concept. So it was created by the original Silver Blue installation, right? And after it's created, it's not really touched until applications there themselves are not creating and updating their the data there. So you do a rebase to an image that includes the packages that are needed to get there, but that rebased image doesn't have anything from, or it doesn't replace the uh, original var. It, that original var is preserved and whatever was in the image is basically silently dropped. You have no idea. To, to be fair, this is all in RPM OS 3 uh, documentation. If you are building on it, you, you need to understand and so on. But this means that packages need to be adopted to handle this. And the uh, other part is that um, in reality, it becomes a bit awkward um, if you have the same packages supporting normal installations without a mutable environment. Because on one hand, the uh, package has uh, folders and files that registered in the RPM database. On the other hand, it should have, for example, TMP, uh, TMP files D 
uh, snippet that says, hey, create these files. So basically by creating them through systemd, tmp, filesd, you're sort of violating the environmental requirements on the normal system, non in nuclear. It's a conflict of um, approaches because as soon as the TMP files D snippet would be active on the normal system, it might um, change the permissions or whatever happens on, on, the, uh, on, the, on this um, system and might trigger RPM um, verification of, of the entries because like this is modified now. So that's kind of a thing that we still fairly bad at finding answer for uh, regardless whether it's IPA or something else. It's just a common problem. Um, okay, fixing that, fixing SLinux context which also wouldn't be propagated um, automatically. Uh, I get server and fail to start a, a, a one of the components, the uh, cert monger. When looking into the cert monger, I actually find out that it simply cannot find another tier system. So this is now uh, a recurring topic. Um, this is another package that needs to be fixed that with the thing like the TMP file D. So yeah, good. Some bugs can be filed. I will file them and fix it um, and use. The good part is that after we're done with, with these kind of fixes in the system, yeah, we're successful. We can, we can enroll and all the rest will just work. So seems to be uh, okay. At least IPA client side does not really uh, complicate things beyond literally a single problem uh, with the uh, bar stuff. But okay, this is where things become pinching. So if we want to support both types of deployments, and in fact, it's not both, it's more than two, it's like three or four types of environments that we, we deal with, we have to somehow build a monster that knows where it lives and adjusts itself. So we become kind of uh, doing what we um, in the hockey culture, they are doing by grafting different species of the uh, uh, trees together to make it resilient and better. So adjusting the um, IPA to OS3 realities in, in, in parts of it is, is kind of easy. Uh, with the TMP files, we understand and everything is good. Some of them not so easy. Some of them may prompt actually rethinking what you can do with this stuff. And frankly, some of these rethinking uh, should have happened earlier as well. And it's not related to running on an immutable system, but we get away in past because we didn't really have an argument for changes like that. I will come to that. So some. Some of those are like configuration thingy is probably the biggest, biggest one. So um, I will not be talking with the TMP files D about um, IP server side intentionally. If I will have some time left, I will talk about it. But client side today, it's it got enough problems <laughs> in itself. Um, but the configuration generators is the, um, is the interesting part. So a uh, bigger part of um, IPA installers is uh, discovering where you work. What is the environment? Uh, and then generating the config files. So there are two big parts of these config files. The um, um, like SSSD configuration and in general the um, system identity and authentication configuration. That includes, um, we kind of outsource a part of it to additional utilities, um, like auth select configures the um, NS switch and palm stack and so on. Uh, and on the other side, we have um, some 
bits and snippets for uh, open SSH to trigger certain behaviors and so on. And um, the other part is Kerberos. The Kerberos part is kind of discovering where and which environment you're working and then configuring it specifically to your machine. Some of these configuration files, and probably uh, almost all of them, maybe aside of an SSH, they have things like test nodes, which are specific to an instance that you are deploying. So they cannot be pre-provided. They have to be generated on the, on the system of the client. But on the, uh, on the other side, um, there's also various system D services that needs to be enabled. So there's something active that happens. You cannot put this just into the uh, um, image building process. Specifically, uh, like discovering what uh, host names will be, what system will use to uh, kind of um, talk to which servers and so on. This highly dependent on, on the deployment, not the build process. Um, if we use something through the build process, then um, we, we need to solve a different problem. So, okay, uh, there is a way to kind of get different contexts for the build and uh, derive them. I think Ublue is actually using now this for um, with this from something as something and then copying out of that uh, context. So we can provide a way for admins to basically tune, configure files, and they do tuning a lot in the uh, um, enterprise environments uh, by uh, tuning on top of what we tune. Uh, they put a lot of um, settings, for example, that when, when they know where a machine is deployed, they, they do like tuning of what, what servers they have to talk to what timeouts are. Sometimes defaults are not enough. They have to rise them or drop them, uh, change the order of servers to communicate with priorities and, and so on, drop or add some filtering and so on. So this would be a, a good way for uh, having this uh, data as a configuration that is, uh, can be derived and produced as a separate image and then consume by the tool. But we need to figure out how generic enough it should be to, to derive this um, image and have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, um, this kind of tooling um, does not exist that produces it from existing configuration so because Yes, you can collect files, you can put in them somewhere, but it's best if you have an installation and you can use the data from existing installation to generate your kind of bootstrap that, that process. We don't have these tools and we, we probably should have. So this is a, a larger project in itself to kind of allow admins to turn existing installation into a prototype of your immutable image building uh, kind of thing. I guess it, it also would help this kind of idea in other projects as well. And the other part is um, the same installer uh, need, need to continue working in immutable environments, in non-OS3 um, environments. So it needs to be detecting in which environment it is and um, detect and, and what do itself, maybe adjust automatically. So this is the part that we, we will have to uh, figure out how to solve, uh, connect together. But as you can see, the traditional one still works. So this is not a big pressure on us. Uh, what is um, becoming interesting with the immutable systems is that they basically uh, both change how you um, look at the um, images at the runtime and also how you uh, should treat certain uh, threads um, uh, uh, when you distribute them. So um, 
we might have a better domain during experience because we are having immutable environment and we have some tooling that allows us to um, validate how things are uh, in the immutable environment specifically. So I will, I will look at this. And one thing to notice, which pretty similar to standard kind of uh, containerized things, is that, uh, yeah, OS3 image is accessible. It's somewhere in the registry. Yes, registry can be protected, but uh, think about organizational registry. Um, literally all people in the organization have credentials to access that registry, most likely, uh, if they're deploying systems. In case your, let's say, workstation is deployed this way, then your machine has access to that registry, obviously, because it will be upgrading. So in, in reality, you cannot use um, the fact that registry is protected as a, as a deterrence against um, attackers uh, who want to attack the systems. And we should treat the content in the registry as a public, publicly available even within the organization. Again, that means that all the security things, the uh, secrets specifically, uh, cannot be in the image. They have to be supplied somewhere. And this is known problem. This is like um, a problem with, with the um, public um, um, cloud providers and they have solutions, intensive solutions for this. Uh, some of these kind of solutions might apply here, some of not. Um, but with the immutable images that we have here, we have an interesting uh, outcome. So there's ability to check the integrity of, of the layers in the image, where they come from, how uh, they were assigned, uh, who modified them, do we trust uh, see, uh, those who signed those images and, and particular layers that we're interested in and, and so on. So. If we do something with this uh, at the uh, deployment time, we can actually trust more uh, the data in disk than we trust now. So IPA client, when it's being installed, it tries to poke into the environment and, for example, discover all the um, um, certificate chains that has to be trusted in the machine to, to make things working. And this is, this is kind of important, um, especially if you have the um, certificate authority that is uh, part of your organization. And uh, there is a chicken and egg problem. So you can not do authentication um, without uh, certain types of authentication, without trust in the um, connections and trust in the certificate chains. But in order to obtain certificate chains securely, and trust in that you have to authenticate somewhere or you trust the content on the disk. And here with the immutable images, we come to an interesting part. If we have a way to assure that the content on the disk was not changed and comes from something we trust, what, which was intentionally built as a part of our image, then we have a way to basically avoid authenticating before getting all this content. The content on disk, we already have a mechanism to verify with the verity and, and other stuff that it is good one. So there is a really good benefit from having these signatures and SBOM and all, all the details as a part of the uh, ACI, uh, OCI image and so on. So that's the good part. And obviously we don't have this now, but it's probably a good general thing to have a mechanism to query, okay, is this file the true file or it was changed uh, by, I don't know, unlocking immutable image, modifying it and putting it in there. If we see that it's, it wasn't really touched, then we can rely on it. And the same thing actually happens with the uh, other stuff. So uh, if we have uh, like factory provisioning, there's a bunch of stuff that is get set at the uh, production of those boxes. 
and then uh, only when they deploy it in some way in the woods, um, we, we see what's there. But we don't have even access over a network to validate uh, them because the only thing we have is, is there. So kind of the uh, model of uh, threat is similar, or if not the same, and the uh, features of the uh, OCI runtime and the uh, imaging can help here a lot. So credentials, get where we get the credentials? So typically they are get site loaded. So Ignition, all these um, cloud init things and so on, they get extensive use of it, but it's, it's really not something you can trust fully because the, uh, uh, if you deploy in cloud, there's cloud provider who can mess, right? If you can uh, in, inject stuff with the uh, system D and threads, that's great. Uh, container runtimes and VM hypervisors, they have mechanisms to attach certain things like TPMs or HSMs and so on, uh, or just pull in some binary things uh, that system D threads can pick up and then use it. Or you can connect the um, tokens with the real hardware to the system and then rely on it. And obviously if you have the uh, TPMs, you can have the cat in the TPM that is signed from something from your organization. So you can have a, um, a proofness uh, chain inside the image that you can use to verify that this is the TPM that is kind of connected to your organization. So things can be, um, can be worked out, but how you can use them together? Because when people deploy um, IP hosts, they typically look into two scenarios. So one of them is, okay, I have privileged user who can make enrollment, or I can generate what we call one-time password, which is literally a, a one-time code that a host object can use to enroll itself. Uh, it cannot be used after you, after you get the, um, this one-time uh, operation done. Well, um, two years ago, we got interest in regress threat. I don't know customer. Um, this is the guy who filed the regress was one of Red Hat uh, technical account managers. And this is the interesting kind of request about uh, really literally uh, uh, factory produced boxes that run somewhere uh, st stripped to the uh, antenna, uh, 5G antenna somewhere. And uh, the only thing they have assurance about is what they put at, at the factory. And th they can vary um, unlike the um, kind of normal images from the registry, they can vary some content, uh, which is in this case, the certificate that they provision. And that certificate has nothing to do with uh, IP. It's the certificate specific to, to the, uh, whatever is appliance is doing. And they, they want to use something like this. So this, is, this looks like a reasonable request. And uh, the only thing is, okay, we don't know properties of the certificate, so we cannot really tell people, is it working or not? And we started looking into what we can do. And the, the one thing that IPA does well is basically Kerberos, right? So we look at this and Kerberos um, has a, a variety of methods. Um, if you will come to the uh, second presentation I have in the afternoon, I will be talking about the, um, a lot of this stuff, um, different methods how we authenticate. Uh, but one of these is uh, so-called PKI init. PKI init is basically use of public cryptography um, to, um, to do some exchange between the uh, client and uh, Kerberos uh, key distribution center. And they uh, basically uh, agree and, and and something like TLS uh, client server security. And not exactly, but it's close enough to think about it. So um, on the KDC side, there is a mechanism that basically says, okay, I got this certificate from the client. 
can I map it to certain purpose principle? And each host that's been enrolled is uh, a purpose service or purpose principle. So if we can map them somehow, then we can authenticate as that uh, purpose principle. And that purpose principle basically can change its own password, can do certain things on itself. So if I can authenticate as the uh, host while holding just a certificate that can be mapped to that host, then that's enough. I can enroll myself. The only requirement here is that KBC actually knows about this host. So it has to be pre-created before um, enrolling. So we did some changes and allow it to pass the um, various um, things that needs to be used by uh, Turbos to pay in it with this. It, it's a what we call smart card authentication, but literally you can get this from anything like uh, uh, just certificate file uh, and key or use some TPM over uh, TPACS 11 uh, token or HSM and other you can even forward this remotely from um, this machine to, to a different one with P11 key. Uh, that's really handy thing because you can do SSH into the machine, forward the um, P11 key request to your machine and on the machine you will never have actual hardware or actual files that represent uh, the uh, smart card and still it will work. Uh, that's, that's handy because admins have a full control over the uh, material and just unix domains of what's been forwarded back and forth. But th there is always a catch. So one, one of those catches is that this mapping um, can be uh, hard to configure by the administrators and um, Fraser uh, from, from our team, he found out that there was um, a possibility of LDAP query injection, similar to SQL query injection, in the mapping process if, you, if you're not careful enough. So for example, if you have DNS name Sam in the certificate, that is a wildcard, start or something, you can inject that into the uh, LDAP query and match more than you want to match. So it's, it's a funny thing. It didn't affect IPA, but it did affect some other uh, use cases. Fix it since that time. This is what's uh, presented um, two years ago at a FOSDEM. And I would recommend to watch it because it's, it's educational. And so we did this uh, support in general and then started uh, looking how we can use this uh, for our own. So IPA supports now using certificate to enroll the machines, how we can actually make it easier to enroll the machine. And part of our team is working on the uh, domain and identity services for the uh, hybrid cloud console that Red Hat provide to console.redhat.com. And part of it is, it's basically creating machine images and then deploying them into um, cloud provider. So you can do uh, Amazon uh, machine or Azure machine or whatever, your local cloud and, and so on. And um, it's not available yet fully but it's in staging. It was presented at this year Red Hat Summit, so um, it is there. And the idea is that, uh, okay, you can connect this um, console to your IPA deployment, and then the machines that you deploy through the console, they automatically get enrolled into the uh, IPA environment. And the way they do is they basically need to have some uh, things on the IP server side to um, control who can and cannot uh, use this mechanism automatically. And there is a client integration part. So <coughs> the client side part is 
very simple. And be because this is Red Hat's service, which is mm, typically supposed to work with the uh, RHEL machines. These RHEL machines need to have in Python time to access the uh, resources, so it uses the uh, RHSM, right, to, to get the subscription for the machine. And that entitlement is actually a, a X Python ARM certificate. So we can use that certificate, which is a machine that is registered with the cloud already. So it has in the entitlement certificate information to which organization it belongs to. We can map that organization on the uh, console side to uh, ID to the IP server side as well, and kind of do this a triangle of uh, trust between the machine, the uh, uh, console, and the IP deployment to, to use it all. So there are a few things that the, uh, should be kind of changed it on the IP server side, mostly about trust in the uh, um, RHCM, uh, RHSM or inside uh, trust of uh, CA trust uh, because it's a separate one and so on. But in, in the end it looks similarly to any other deployment using PKI in, um, in, in IPA. So basically you just pass the parameters that you need there. Only that you don't pass it. It's the system automatically registers itself on the first boot and automatically enrolls itself on the first boot. So once you get to the machine, uh, you can use all the uh, IP features on it. So it gets all the uh, centralized users. You don't need to handle one user. You don't need to use SSH keys because you can use all the mechanisms that IPA supports for users, like all the passwordless methods we have. Um, you can use all the uh, sudo rules, hpac rules, and all. this is automatic. And that's the nice part. So it it's took some time to get this fleshed out, and we made, as I, as I show it, this separate project for it. The um, coding goal is the uh, Portugal breed of um, dogs, right? and also play on pod and go, because the server side of it is written in go, and deploy it as pod and so on and so on. Um, <coughs> coming back to the client. Um, okay, you have a client that is registered uh, with your system. Um, enterprise systems, they have one interesting kind of property. They always have uh, regulations, compliance that is making things um, annoying for many um, users, but very important to actual business organization. So, for example, U.S. government um, enforces uh, a certain part of the uh, FIPS 140-3 requirements, and that means, and this is a big part of what REL uh, is doing in, in general, and it, that means that all applications have to follow certain policies, the crypto policies that we define. It's a, it's a lot of different things, but it's a combination of configuration files for crypto libraries and other applications, and also a software. So basically libraries, plugins, and so on. So yes, you have them on the system, but um, a typical use for immutable systems like uh, RPMS, three basic ones, is that you don't really uh, install applications into the main kind of system. You install them in uh, environments within your system. Uh, basically, truths, truths everywhere. In, in like, they are not truths, but they're truths, literally. Namespaces with its own uh, binaries with its own configuration files and so on. There is some effort um, in the flat packs, for example, to um, transparently promote some of the uh, configuration files from the flat. Um, for example, the um, 
whether it's a resolve that conf uh, hosts and um, some other known parts gets promoted so that you get some blended uh, setup. Um, with the um, toolbox and distro box, you get even more files promoted, but not really everything. So you quickly realize that if you installed, for example, Firefox uh, from Flatpak, that one will not be uh, um, Hoops compliant even if your system is in working in Hoops because it doesn't uh, have all the same content that should be uh, using the uh, Hoops module that is certified by uh, government. So the binary within that flat pack might not be the same binary that is actually certified and should be used. And that's a, a, a huge um, concern for web organizations, but it's not really addressed well. The other problem is that um, <coughs> these libraries, uh, they might, um, uh, the configuration files might include references to plugins that don't exist within your execution environment. So for example, if you have, um, if you use toolbox and um, your system built on Fedora 40, but your toolbox is using Fedora 38, or RHEL 7 or RHEL 8 because you want to build packages within it. Um, chances are that you don't have the um, appropriate components installed within that uh, toolbox instance that would be using the same uh, configuration that's on the host. So for example, um, your configuration on the host is using Kerberos with uh, passwordless method. But your toolbox has Kerberos enabled, but it doesn't have plugins that uh, support your particular passwordless method. So for example, Fiber 2 tokens. So you get an error because even if you copy configuration files over into the toolbox, um, even flat pack, um, these are incorrect. They reference objects that are not existing. Uh, Kerberos library will fail to load uh, at runtime these files and it will not use your stuff. It will be using maybe only password basic um, authentication but not the uh, passwordless. And if your setup is that you cannot use passwords, you only can use smart cards or you can use uh, target key tokens keys and so on, that you're, you're left with the idea that you cannot use Kerberos within, or at least not initiate uh, acquisition of a ticket within that environment like Flatpak or Toolbox. And this is, this is unsolved problem because in general it's um, a framework specific and application specific knowledge that needs to be somehow funneled inside the environment and at, at odds with the environment because there is no guarantee, there is no, um, literally no way to tell that the software from the host and software within that toolbox or flat pack environment are binary compatible. So, Either we leave it as it is and document and make confusion for future, uh, or we, we should think something. For example, an easy way is to ensure that uh, components that you use, for example, flat packs are built using the same runtime levels, more or less, and uh, don't, if you have some legacy stuff or advanced stuff, uh, you should not be using the features that shouldn't work there. Um, but that's kind of, I can see uh, how this complicates life of the administrators, definitely. Especially ex um, debugging and, and explaining to the customers why they cannot print on a printer from a PDF application that was installed from Flatpak and cannot use their Kerberos tool or cannot start acquiring Kerberos tools.
And this is literally what I have. And we have some time to uh, discuss if you have any questions. I promise that I wouldn't be talking about the server side, uh, IPA server. The um, server um, is a dif difficult story because um, it's making a lot of assumptions. And um, some of these assumptions different for server running on in a VM and a server running in a container. So we have free API container upstream project that basically wraps normal um, tooling with something that uh, detects the uh, use cases based on how instance is launching. And it uses some different places where to put the data because um, you cannot really modify certain things. But um, recently we started looking into uh, boot C which is basically producing a single image that can be used as a container and deployed to a VM. So when it's deployed to VM, it will have the same kind of issues with the uh, um, var and so on. So probably less of them because it's like you deploy from scratch. So what if you have that image, it will probably have the var probably, uh, properly uh, uh, populated during the uh, creation time. So only when you start rebasing, you get the template. But for the container, container basically uh, um, starts a specific application as a CNF point, and that would not work uh, with this approach. So we need to fix one or fix the other, and in both cases, fix both, okay? Yeah, so you talked about one of the user experience issues, um, specifically like around printing in a domain joined environment, because if you install from the flat pack, you're not, you don't have access to the Kerberos ticket, therefore it's not being sent. Are there any other like big obvious, you know, user experience issues that users will have with trying to utilize an atomic system in, you know, like a domain joined environment? I'm very curious to know like the other things that people would run into. Networking file system mounting from within the um, namespaces, so flat packs and, and so on, accessing them directly will have a bit of a trouble. So setting things up with the uh, SubID of GID um, will be something we would need to look into uh, properly. Also because um, if you have um, host credentials, they are on the host, not within the, uh, um, like this. A day has passed, so <laughs> I have to reconnect, uh, hopefully. And uh, that means that uh, you always have this trouble with the uh, host side um, within a namespace side thingy. Uh, let me close this one. Um, but at the same time, there are some projects who are trying to build what, what they call portals, right? Trying to isolate access to the actual host uh, system through um, some services, the bus based services have been provided. So maybe that can be used to uh, avoid some of these issues, uh, but somebody has to um, write these portals and specifically handle the cases where um, printing authentication should happen on the host or in a specialized namespace and access it through the uh, portal. Um, there are a few uh, ugly things they are like the applications that really need direct access um, to the credentials. Um, it's uh, the, the way we try to solve it is through um, GSS proxy. GSS proxy is a tooling that basically hides access, direct access to credentials, it encrypts them 
and um, yeah, applications using GSS API with serverless mechanism work transparently. Um, to until recently, maybe in late last year, GSS proxy was not really usable within these flat pack style environments. Uh, this was fixed. Um, there are still a few things that needs to be fixed, but this, this one should work. Um, in general, uh, what is missing is a, is a comprehensive testing of all these kind of setup. There are so many bugs lurking around and they are not being tested by a, a basic infrastructure test for um, blue, silver blue or by you blue because you don't care about that yet. And specifically because silver blue has no components that would allow it to use it. But in in um, in Fedora, in OpenQA, we have comprehensive testing of IPA and uh, Samba AD. So we have environments. We can technically create uh, silver blue based uh, enterprise client images and then enroll them in those environments and try testing. So we, we had some discussion about this with Fedora QA people uh, yesterday, and hopefully we'll get the plan to continue on it. This brings um, some interesting testing that nobody is doing. It's, it's the question of finding resources, uh, meaning people and time um, to have it all. But even spelling out these problems is, is usable because in many cases people don't understand outside of the like environment. And it seemed to be most of the um, immutable work is kind of parallel to the enterprise environment. They do not really overlap. Um, experience wise as people so it's usable to cross over um, yep any other questions yeah. so thank you very much